this talk in some respects will try to bring together some reflections on philosophy and neuroscience a little bit as well. There's so many details and things to cover that it will be no more than sort of an impressionist painting of sort of sketch even of sort of the outlines. So maybe things will come up in Q&A that we can sort of get into some more detailed things because all the sort of empirical stuff I'll touch on will be very sort of quick and fast. St. Thomas Aquinas approached philosophical anthropology with the wonder of the psalmist who asked of his maker, what is man? What is it about human persons that God is mindful of them? In his commentary on Psalm 8, Brother Tell Thomas tells us that David begins this psalm with thanks for the benefits God has conferred upon the entire human race. And I would like to begin by reaffirming our gratitude to the maker, especially for having blessed us with 800 years of the Dominican order and for the special light our Lord shared with St. Thomas, who so generously shared with us his love for the truth that is Christ. And also thank you very much to Father Richard and um, the Dominicans for having me here to talk about various ways in which Thomas Aquinas, way back when, can still, I think, frame and provide insights in how to ask contemporary questions about human nature and especially its relationship with cognitive neuroscience. The central question addressed by philosophical anthropology is, of course, what is it to be human? What's so extraordinary about Psalm 8 and Aquinas' commentary on it is the way it contextualizes the question, what is it to be human? It sets humanity within the cosmos God created. Humans are less than angels, but greater than beasts. They come into the world as humble babes, yet the Lord has deigned to endow them not only with speech, but with the capacity to understand their smallness in comparison to the vast marvels of creation, which are themselves utterly outstripped by the admirable greatness of their creator. Most significant of all in this psalm, especially for our interest in the human person, is the self-reflective act that reveals the precise character or differentia of the human, to wonder and inquire, what is man? Why is it that you, Lord, are mindful of humans, that you attend to us, that you visit us, as in prayer, but most dramatically as you visit us in our very human nature. You visit us in Christ, and you continue to visit us in the Eucharist. We find here in Psalm 8 the whole of Christian theology, which contextualizes the question about what are human persons. Brother Thomas approached the question of human nature as a theologian, and accordingly situated his extensive treatments of theological anthropology in the two sumai within the creation of the triune God situated between angels and non-human animals. And there are hidden here some important lessons concerning the wider context within which inquiries of philosophical anthropology belong. First, humans are God's creatures. They are created in the image of God, but they are neither dissembled minds nor unintelligent, non-rational animals. Thomas Aquinas provides us a nice quote for the sort of medieval idea of how humans are a microcosm of the macrocosm of God's creation. Thomas says that the human is situated at the boundary line between corporeal and incorporeal substances, as though it existed on the horizon of eternity and time. It approaches the highest by withdrawing from the lowest. This account is nicely summed by the medieval notion that each human is a microcosm of God's creation. And they're not just theological truths for Thomas, they're also conceptual boundaries that keep philosophical anthropology within the joints of human nature. Clarity about the cognitive and cognitive, cognitive capacities of dolphins, chimpanzees, and crows, as well as of Michael, Gabriel, and Raphael, they also elucidate the liminal poles of human nature. And the failure to distinguish these horizons can lead to false conceptions of humans by elevating them into Cartesian minds or reducing them to human animals. A second lesson of contextualization comes from the way that Brother Thomas approaches the practical human action and questions of ethics, providence, and soteriology through his investigation of theoretical truths about human nature. The human form of life can be truly perfect by living a life ordered towards God. Being human is constituted by being a particular nature, which is itself a living of certain rationally governed animal activities. No story of human nature is complete without a deep consideration of the goods of the acted upon and the acting human person, whose cultivation of virtues or vices through practical reason and human action is contingent upon one's development and education within a social and linguistic 
dependent rational environment that's embedded within a culture or history. Okay. So this nicely sets up sort of a context, and from here we'll sort of get deeper into actual philosophical anthropology proper. But it's important to see for Thomas's account of human nature how he situates it in between a treatment of disembodied intellects, contrary to some philosophers who think of humans as disembodied intellects or minds, and from just a mere treatment of humans as being like animals. They sort of provide two conceptual pillars or two boundaries that help organize and unite this philosophical anthropology in the right context. But also in this wider theological context is a question of ethics, which I'm not going to treat moral psychology or anything here, but a, a com comprehensive account of human nature has to engage and be interested in questions of moral psychology as well, which then steps into issues about salvation, the sacraments, and, and the whole other aspects of, um, of moral theology. So let's start with some sort of context issues with respect to Thomas and how he approached philosophical anthropology and what we might do to transition for today. <coughs> so it's important to note that Thomas, though, has two very long, extensive treatments of philosophical anthropology in both the Summa Contra Gentiles and the Summa Theologia. In neither case is Thomas following what he would have considered to be the philosophical order. In both instances, Thomas is treating human nature, its subdivision in the soul and body, the powers, and then more or less some treatments of the operations. But for the philosophical order, which he gets from Aristotle, is to go from objects to various sorts of operations and then to the powers and the nature. So it's interesting that we're turning to Thomas to look for our philosophical anthropology, but Thomas himself doesn't provide an actual illustration of philosophical anthropology following the sort of proper order that he sets up. The proper order for Thomas would be to begin seeing human beings within a larger context of natural philosophy. And so it's within his natural philosophy he articulates the doctrine of hylomorphism, of form to matter, form is actuality, matter is potentiality. And this general structure of nature starts to add levels and starts to get more detailed and more dense as we work our way through. So from the treatment of just form and matter applied to all physical or natural entities, he goes to a more concrete version of that with respect to animals. And so we see in the Danima of Aristotle and Aquinas' commentary on it a significant treatment of humans, but it's not a per se treatment of humans as such. It's of all living beings. He focuses mostly on animals and humans within the Danima, but properly speaking, it's not a de homine treatise. It's not a work on human beings from a philosophical perspective. It's on the whole of animals with some emphasis on human beings. And there are further deepening principles of Thomas's hylomorphism as we go from a hylomorphism to a hylomorphic animism, so the treatment of living hylomorphic entities, to a hylomorphic animalism, where we move into now animals as hylomorphically constituted and the unique features of that. And then specifically, how Thomas has to modulate Aristotle's natural philosophy and add some metaphysical principles to, to properly treat the way that a human being is hylomorphically composed, but is nevertheless a person. Okay. There's a lot contained within those sort of levels, but we're not going to get into the details of that. Should questions come up, we can talk about what I mean by hylomorphic animalism or personalism. As I said earlier, what organizes this sort of inquiry for Thomas is a principle he gets from Aristotle from Book 2 of the Danima. If we want to know the nature of a thing, well, then you need to know its powers. And if you want to know its powers, you have to know the operations of the various active and passive powers. And in order to know those, you need to identify the various principles or causes or objects that, that motivate or actualize these various operations. So Aristotle says we need to go from objects to operations to powers to nature. I've got some schema or sketches of how Thomas's philosophical anthropology lays itself out. We have down here a long investigation of all the different objects, the different powers, sorry, operations, and the distinct powers. And he moves from here to here to here. If you want to see it, this done, and you know, he goes through this very, very rapidly in the Summa Theologia in questions um, 78 through 83 of the Prima Pars. But he will do a very, very rapid sort of presentation of this. You also get a presentation of this starting in Book 2, Chapter 6 of his commentary on Aristotle's Danima, up through about the middle of um, Book 3 of the commentary on the Danima. But this is the basic way that Thomas would proceed philosophically. So how he was interested in laying out what human nature was is by laying out all these objects 
figuring out both what they are as known to us, but also their sort of intrinsic metaphysical structure, how they were very, these objects actualize different kinds of operations, not just sensory operations and intellectual ones, but also appetitive operations, as well as the operations with respect to willing. So this sort of broad sketch of all the different objects and the operations that Thomas finds for <coughs> sensitive and intellective powers. Okay. An alternative creative sketch is found over there, so if that's helpful to have in mind. This is a sort of division of that one. This is obviously very complicated and would take a whole course to walk through all the different steps of how these various powers interact with each other and move one another. You can get pretty creative about how they're related. Now, what's important for us is not following and trying to do some philosophical archaeology and just figure out what Thomas had to say. It's a little bit presumptuous to think that everything Thomas had to say about philosophical anthropology is not going to meet with any new challenges or in any new sort of questions. But it does provide a very, very helpful model. And in so is the philosophical principles that he applied to develop and articulate this philosophical anthropology. And so long far as those conceptual principles stand today, it would make Mary speeches of Thomas's view that are sort of independent from his empirical knowledge, it would make them you know, a suitable contender to be taken seriously today. So basically the point is that Thomas Aquinas' philosophical anthropology, it provides contemporary philosophers today with a heuristic or a methodology or a methodological way of asking questions about objects, operations, powers, and the nature of human persons. So that reading him provides a sort of general education or formation and how to think through philosophical anthropology today. Not that we arrive at the same conclusions, but we use his principles to see if we should arrive at the same sort of conclusions. And what I'm going to talk about for the rest of the, the lecture is three stages within a heuristic that Thomas provides us. Stages in which we can move to developing a philosophical anthropology. Stages that someone interested in philosophical anthropology, I think, or contend, would need to walk through, would need to work their way through. The first stage is a sort of descriptive psychology. It's starting with what's prior and more known to us, the quod nos, as Thomas will say. There's a general Aristotelian principle that you start right in the middle of things, and you start with what's more known to us. You don't start with things as defined in, or conceptualized with respect to themselves. You gradually move towards those sorts of definitions. One thing that's very important about this principle of starting with what's more known to us is that contemporary philosophy of mind jumps straight to the mind-body problem typically. There's not a lot of phenomenology or conceptual or descriptive psychology that goes in. One immediately launches into a very detailed and very complicated um, arguments and defining of principles about abstract things like mental causation, the way in which the physical can or cannot have the mental act upon it, the way in which the mental is defined separate from the physical. It's an immediately very sort of metaphysically deep conversation that goes on without any sort of slow, patient description of all of our different sort of psychological capacities and operations. The point here about the heuristic for Thomas is it's very patient and very slow. We're not going to get to this sort of metaphysical descriptions until we've passed go, so to speak, of the descriptive psychology, and then applied the descriptive psychology to empirical psychology, and then we're finally sort of, I believe, in a position to start asking these deeper metaphysical questions. So as I say here, what we do is we go from a common sense psychology to something of a sort of regimented phenomenology of the human person. Next, we turn to scientific explanations of descriptive psychology, and that works both ways. There's ways in which we'll see that descriptive psychology sort of interrogates the assumed conceptual framework that's used in empirical psychology, but there's also clear ways in which empirical psychology suggests challenges and might raise reasons for reevaluating or rearticulating or maneuvering our descriptive psychology. The sort of armchair philosophy we do at the descriptive psychology stage meets with real genuine conceptual challenges at the stage of experimental psychology. And then finally, the, the two come together in a sort of synthesis to then start asking questions, not just about sort of surface ontology, but what's the real reality of these? Have we described some natural kinds in terms of psychological powers or capacities or operations? 
and answering and addressing some metaphysics questions about mind and body and those sorts of issues. Okay. Here's um, the subdivisions within them, but we'll get to more details in just a second. So stage one, the descriptive psychology, from common sense to regimented descriptions. There's essentially three stages that occur here. The first is just sort of reflection on the psychology that we all sort of employ to describe each other, to describe the animals that are around us. We recognize automatically, connaturally, the other beings that are around us are psychological agents. So we have grounds for doing that, and how do we describe those? I think it's naive and problematic to think of this as sort of a pure phenomenology. We all have so many backgrounds, we read and watch movies, and we think about empirical science and popular science. It's all sort of a, a mess. It's a bit of a piecemeal where we've gotten all of our categories from. So the first sort of stage is to begin reflecting and trying to elucidate and clarify all the different psychological categories that we employ and try to get down, if possible, to some sort of ground, some sort of foundation of our descriptive psychology. And the first thing to recognize is we might have, if we're English speakers, all of our categories somewhat determined by the language we use and the conceptual clarifications we make as English speakers. Also, most of us are probably Western thinkers, and so we've been tremendously influenced by the Greeks and by Latin psychology. And so it's very important to do a very slow-going ethnopsychology. In other words, looking at other cultures and looking at other linguistic groups and seeing when we use terms like mind and seeing and hearing and memory, are these natural kinds or getting close to natural kinds? Or are they just simply these categories are artifacts of the sort of Western languages we use? So a detailed investigation, or at least an inquiry into sort of the sociology or ethnology of psychology, can at least provide some illuminating clarifications that what we think, and we're dead set on thinking, are real natural kinds that grab onto the joints of reality, in fact, are just artifacts of the English language that we've been using. And this would also, I think, be utilizing a wide variety of phenomenology of common sense to actually have some traction by looking at, say, Arabic uses of certain psychological terms or looking at Japanese uses of certain psychological terms. You have to employ a phenomenology and a reflection, a sort of introspection on your own categories to see they're kind of naming an emotion that I don't have a word for. They're naming a sort of pattern of psychological operation that I don't have a word for. So there's a kind of phenomenology that has to be involved here, a sort of reflective introspection on our different cognitive acts. Ah, oh, sorry. The next stage is getting much more clear and regimented about this. As you will see through an ethnology, it's kind of kind of be all over the place. And is there any way that in light of these sort of investigations, we can get really, really clear about how do we use these terms. And this is where I think we can be very much um, helped by looking at certain Wittgensteinian in this, um, linguistic investigations. In particular, I have in mind people like, well, Wittgenstein, Gilbert Ryle, Anscombe, Geach, Peter Hacker, um, Anthony Kenny, and others who've written quite carefully using sort of Wittgensteinian tools to analyze the way in which we use these different psychological categories. Finally, the last stage would be trying to bring this to a more regimented order. If you follow some of these very, very helpful writings of people like Peter Hacker or Anthony Kinney, they often want to follow out and show you, as we should expect, the, the conventions of language often don't make our terminology really, really precise. That we tend to um, use words in all sorts of variety of ways that aren't going to come under a sort of systematic, coherent sort of story. Let's see. I've got a nice quote here. Here. And there's going to be a temptation, the Wittgensteinians will point out for us, to try to systematize and try to organize and do a co coherent structure all of our different sort of psychological terms. Uh, so this nice quote from Wittgenstein kind of clarifies this view. Mere description is so difficult because one believes that one needs to fill out the facts in order to understand them. It is as if one saw a screen with scattered color patches and said, the way they are here, they are unintelligible. They only make sense when one completes them into a shape. Whereas I want to say, here is the whole. If you complete it, you falsify it. So if you start doing an analysis of the term like belief, 
You might start thinking, well, belief's a propositional attitude, it's something that's true or false. And you start actually reflecting on how people use the word belief, how you employ the word belief. You start realizing that some of the ways that you fit it into a mold, a sort of philosophical category, is actually falsifying a lot of the ways we use the word belief, or the way we use the word desire, or the way we use certain emotions or attitudes, or especially terms like memory or consciousness. So what the Wittgensteinian method often does is it leaves, it, it, it provides a very clear, articulate sort of pattern. It shows you all the different uses, but then it turns out a lot of terms overlap. The way we use the word memory, the way we use the word knowledge, they often have a lot of affinities and overlapping which is really, really helpful that the Wittgensteinians show this to us and bring this to our attention. You might be convicted that memory only has to do with the past, but if you do a careful analysis of the language, you'll talk about what I needed to remember to do tomorrow, what I needed to remember to do today. There's all sorts of ways in which we naturally use these terms that don't reflect some of our philosophical pre presuppositions or assumptions about how they work. What someone like Peter Hacker has proposed is based on looking at Wittgenstein. Here's 21 non-exhaustive non parameters of ways we might sift through and work through all of our different psychological terms to try to clarify how exactly we use them. I'm not going to go through all of these, but this comes from Peter Hacker's um, Wittgenstein's Mind and World. It's the fourth volume of his massive 11 or 12 volume commentary on the philosophical investigations. So it's the last volume of essays, and it's the essay on Wittgenstein's philosophical psychology. But he goes through here and lays out that what you want to do is look at different types of first-person, third-person symmetries and the present tense use of different psychological words and how there's unusual asymmetries that we oftentimes don't notice. He also thinks that it's important to look at them in terms of formal categories. So is belief an act? Is belief an activity? Is belief a process? Is it a disposition? All these sort of formal categories, does belief sit there? Is it a kind of state? You'll see philosophers all the time talking about a belief state or a mental state or a mental process or a belief process or a memory process or a mem memory state. What Hacker does and goes through and shows how these, these concepts typically don't fit in any of these categories very nicely. That you can find it used in a dispositional sense, you can find it used in a state sense, and those are meant to be formal categories that are often not overlapping. Um, other uses of looking at some of these terms, do they have any sort of localization? Is localization belong to the use of belief? What about bodily localization for pain? Is bodily localization essential to the use of the term pain terms? Um, other ones have to do with language dependency. Pain is a kind of linguistic term that you can make sense of independently from language, but does belief or knowledge or memory, do these concepts make sense with or without language? Are they necessarily dependent upon them? So if one were to go through these sort of 21 parameters or even more, one would begin to get, I think you would imagine, a very thorough sense of the different sort of psychological terms. This would be a rather arduous and grueling process, but fortunately Peter Hacker is in the middle of doing it in his four volume Philosophical Anthropology. So I really would commend you to look at the first two volumes that have already come out. The second one's supposed to be on emotions, and I imagine it's going to be as good as the last one, which was on intellectual powers, and he covers cogitation, imagination, memory, knowledge, belief, and so forth. So those are really, really helpful studies for looking through. That's a really bad uh, image, but this is one of the divisions of different human psychological faculties that Hacker has in the first volume. So he subdivides feeling, perception, desire, thought, memory, memory into factual and perception, personal, um, a desire into appetite and will. He has feelings into sensations and affections, moods, emotions, attitudes, localized sensations versus overall sensations. Now, the difficulty with this is we eventually want to use our descriptive psychology and we would like to operationalize it. We'd like to employ it in an experimental setting. In other words, we need technical uses of these terms that borrow or employ the sort of lucidity, the clarity that we get from this sort of Wittgensteinian linguistic analysis, but it won't do, and it's not going to be very systematic and or efficient if memory and knowledge don't have real clear boundaries. So we can concede the point about ordinary use, that memory and knowledge often sort of overlap with each other. But when it comes to an experimental, empirical setting, we really would like to have a technical, regimented terminology where we acknowledge that sometimes the way we use these terms overlap. But we would like to have a really clear, systematic, well-distributed and distinguished 
set of psychological terms to employ in psychology so that we know when we're doing memory research, we're not overlapping also with knowledge research. And it's certainly questionable a lot of the work on semantic memory and episodic memory and neuropsychology today or in cognitive psychology that how these two terms get distinguished and what their relationship is to knowledge is often rather confusing and, and unclear. So the point is, is that this Wittgensteinian sort of approach is very, very helpful, but it only goes so far. We need to go a, a further step, and that's to provide a sort of regimented um, demarcations of them, that they would be systematically distinguished and not overlapping terms. We're also hoping that we're trying to uncover if there are natural kinds in psychology, okay, to try to sift through and give technical descriptions for what they are. Also, what's interesting is we begin to see the emergence of metaphysical categories. Whenever we start classifying and describing them, we start seeing coming forth the ideas of agency and abilities, capacities, states, events, and processes. But it's important, I think, at this stage to be patient and keep a sort of surface ontology, to not go into deep metaphysical statements or assertions about having found natural kinds, knowing for certain that these are the categories of the natural kinds based on the sort of regimented um, descriptive psychology that also employs a sort of phenomenology of the human person. So I think the concluding stage of the descriptive psychology is essentially we've arrived at something like the phenomenology of the human person that's been purified and clarified by using ordinary common sense psychology looking at sort of an ethnopsychology to sort of get a much wider horizon beyond the language categories that we're used to for psychology, working through a very careful linguistic Wittgensteinian sort of analysis, and finally making, sometimes arbitrary, but making very systematic, technical, regimented demarcations, and how we're going to elucidate and employ our psychology within um, our descriptive psychology within an empirical psychology. Okay, so the next stage is the empirical psychology, and now we're getting into explanations of descriptive psychology. There's a number of stages here. I won't go into as much detail on all of them, but the first is we'll employ the descriptive psychology to sort of interrogate contemporary conceptual paradigms in empirical psychology. And once again, Peter Hacker has done this quite marvelously along with Max Bennett in two volumes, one called The Philosophical Foundations of Neuroscience, published in 2003, and then, which was a book written for, broadly speaking, philosophers. And then they wrote a book that was specifically for cognitive neuroscientists covering some um, sort of paradigm cases and experiments in various areas of psychology and neuroscience. And they wrote this other volume, History of Cognitive Neuroscience, for them. Um, I would recommend checking out both those books, but they go into consciousness studies, self-consciousness studies, neuroscience of free will, emotion, uh, sensation and perceptual studies, studies on illusions. They also are also interested in features of the motor cortex and memory, cogitation, imagination, and I think there's some sections on knowledge as well. So it's, it's, it's quite an ensemble of different topics in neuropsychology, psychology, developmental psychology, and cognitive neuroscience that they're covering in these books. So that would be a, a really clear illustration of what I have in mind there. The second thing is then actually operationalizing, employing these psychological categories within experiments themselves, a lot of which is already, you know, done. And once one does this, one sees a number of things that will happen. There's going to be challenges to the descriptive psychology. There's going to be amplifications, new data to be integrated. So not necessarily objections or challenges or ways of undermining the descriptive psychology, but just a lot more details or richer features, as well as some confirmations. So one example of applying something like a descriptive psychology is um, the recent work of Joseph Ledoux. Joseph Ledoux is quite famous for some older books he wrote called The Emotional Brain and the Synaptic Self. He sort of has pioneered a lot of work on um, the amygdala and its role in fear systems or fear um, conditioning. And for a long time now, almost 30 years, this system has been described as the fear system. And they've worked on mostly rodents. And Joe Ledoux, in the last two years, has been publishing it quite a bit. And he has a new book that came out this last summer called Anxiety. And he's had a bit of a conceptual change, a conceptual insight he could have had 30 years ago. But it's only recently that he's come to the realization that why did we call this the fear system? 
This system has nothing to do with the conscious awareness of fear. This system has to do with the way that an animal non-consciously responds and detects threats in their environment. And in fact, the neural architecture that undergirds fear and anxiety responses, actually the conscious human awareness of fear and anxiety, that's a completely distinct neurological um, substructure. So why did we call the one this, why did we mislabel it or use an ordinary common sense psychology term to um, label this non-conscious system that actually wasn't responsible for it? So this is what he says in a recent article of his, but you can see him telling the same story in the new book, Anxiety. The story of fear research also illustrates the perils of using an everyday term about human subjective experience like fear as a non-subjective scientific term. When those not in the know about the non-subjective meaning of fear, whether they are scientists, lay people, or journalists, encounter the term fear, they naturally conclude that the research is about fear as a feeling. Loose talk by those who believe otherwise promotes misunderstanding. Researchers today can commonly be heard to say, we used freezing as a measure of fear. I've done this myself. The burden is on scientists who think of fear in non-subjective terms to be clear about what they mean because the default everyday meaning of fear needs no such help. So the idea is that certain sort of conceptual clarification can actually aid the empirical research to make it clear about what's going on, but also for important reasons for how you um, communicate this in a clinical situation or the way in which you want to communicate this from a human condition to an animal condition. And it starts raising all sorts of other sort of questions and objections if you're using a very conceptual, sorry, a very consciousness rooted term to describe a very non-conscious process. So there's lots of issues in translational cognitive neuroscience between trying to be clear about memory in a human and memory in a rat, fear in a rat, fear in a human, and how you get clear about the two structures, whether they have the same neurological structures, whether they interact the same way or not. Here's a further quote from Ledoux that also pushes this issue. The problem's not in the terms, but the way we use them. Specifically, problems arise when we conflate terms that refer to conscious experiences with those that refer to the processing of stimuli and control of responses and assume that the brain mechanisms that underlie the two kinds of processes are the same. By making mild changes that capture these distinctions, we have an easy fix that has the potential for eliminating much of the terminological confusion in the field. Another point of interest is thinking about operationalizing these sort of conceptual categories and seeing if we get confirmations or disconfirmations in the empirical literature. What way can the empirical literature confirm or disconfirm? One thing that's interesting as well is that Thomas Aquinas, using the sort of conceptual techniques I described earlier of objects and operations powers, he distinguished fear and anxiety through these conceptual distinctions. Fear pertains to known arduous evils. Whereas anxiety consists in anticipated threats or arduous evils that are unknown. Okay. What's very interesting is that Ledoux, this past year in his new book, Anxiety, basically distinguishes the two by the same basic conceptual distinction. To experience fear is to know that you are in a dangerous situation. To experience anxiety is to worry about whether future threats may harm you. Okay. Very similar conceptual definitions. What what Ledoux goes on to do is then uh, look at the way in which there's different neural substructures that actually undergird these two different features. So he's looking for a way in which actually finding or attempting to find double disassociations, where if you can knock out the neural substructures for, um, for fear, you would still have intact the structures for anxiety, whereas if you knocked out the ones for anxiety, you could still have the ones intact for fear. Okay? Now, there's some questionable things to be said about some things to do with double dissociation and also some of the conceptual framework of Ledoux, but I'm not going to get into those. If you want to read about those, Peter Hacker has some quite clear critiques and criticisms of some of Ledoux's conceptual framework. But this is just an illustration of something that might potentially be a way in which the empirical literature can provide a confirmation by doing experimental um, experiments looking for double dissociations that confirm or disconfirm conceptual distinctions that we made about, say, two passions or two emotions, fear and anxiety. Okay. Another example of a way in which 
we might have challenges. It has to do with Libet and Haggard and Hayes and some other recent replications of the, the Libet experiments on free will. So I'm not sure, I'm sure if people are familiar with these or not. But back in 1983, Benjamin Levitt published an article on uh, the an article that since has launched a large field of research amongst philosophers, psychologists, and neuroscientists on the brain science of free will. Um, without getting into too many details, Libet's experiment was looking at the supplementary motor cortex, and there is what he called a uh, readiness potential, a sort of spike of energy going on in the supplementary motor cortex that could be detected about 500 milliseconds or 350 milliseconds antecedent to the patient or the subject being aware of their conscious decision, their free choice, or their conscious awareness of the intention to move their hand. Okay? These experiments have such since got much more elaborate and much more detailed, but Lebet came to the conclusion that um, these patients had their motor acts, spontaneous motor acts that they believed were voluntarily made or freely made, that these spontaneous voluntary motor acts were actually initiated by parts of the supplementary motor cortex about 350 milliseconds prior to their awareness of a voluntary motor act. But Levivit was very careful, and some people aren't so careful in the way they, they, they interpret him, but if you read the last few pages of the article, he says this has nothing to do with planned activities, so a decision that one might make basis of planning, because the patients were to just, well, I'll tell you what they were told, but he, he thought he was ruling out planned voluntary activity. It also has um, nothing to do with things, voluntary acts that are other than motor acts, right? So this was simply a sort of motor sort of engagement, so not the sort of voluntary decision to maybe start imagining something, the voluntary decision to start engaging in mathematics. But another interesting thing he found is that patients said that they would become aware of their intention, they would become aware of their conscious decision to make a motor movement, and they could stop themselves from doing it. So what became popularized after this is, well, maybe we don't have free will, we at least have free won't. So recently Patrick Haggard now has sort of done some experiments, and he thinks he can actually disconfirm that we even have free won't. That what's shown is two distinct, um, discrete, identifiable um, actions going on antecedent. One that he targets or indexes with um, the, 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 the will to, and then the one the will not to. And so has actually tried to say that this isn't the case, that there's neither free will nor free won't. Things get a little bit more nuanced, and there's other sort of questions about how the data's been interpreted. But one thing that hasn't been really treated in the literature, except for by a few Wittgensteinians, and a point that Thomas Aquinas would make as well, is that there's some lack of clarity here, conceptually and descriptively, about what constitutes a human action. Okay? So now, what, what actually was asked in the questions or for, of the patients, and has also been asked in more recent experiments, is the subjects are asked to sit and not make any sort of plan. Don't plan to move your right hand at a certain sort of time. Don't plan to move your finger or the left finger or the right hand. But what you need to do is you need to wait and spontaneously, as soon as you are aware of an urge or aware of an intention, that's when you make your decision and that's when you act. So the description of a human action here is one where one sits and waits for an intention, become aware of an intention or become aware of a voluntary action. Now, Thomas in the Prima Pars of the Summa Theologia, question six, he makes a distinction between human action and acts of a human. It's a sort of standard distinction that's elementary to philosophy of human action. There's things that we do, human actions, and there's all, all variety of things that happen to us. Characteristic things like, I might propose a restaurant we go to, and then you consider it, and whether or not we should go to that restaurant or not. Someone might tell you, don't think about a pink elephant, and then suddenly you imagine a pink elephant. All right? You might be rained upon, someone might lift your arm. These are all characteristic, paradigmatic examples of things that happen to you. They're acts of the human, not human actions. Whereas a human action is the sort of thing that you just sort of perform, like when I just lift my arm. I don't wait for the free intention to pop up in my head. I don't wait for the conscious urge to move my arm. I just do it. There's just a human action. So it, what is important then for analyzing and evaluating the Libet cases is that these are paradigmatic cases, for Thomas at least, of acts of the human. 
The subjects are told to sit and spontaneously wait until they feel the urge or become aware of the intention to make an action. So in the Libet case, the way they describe and ask the, the patients to do what to do, they call it a voluntary action. But for Thomas, it fits under the category of an act of a human, not of a human action. So all the Libet cases and all the recent reiterations of those experiments, all of them are focusing on paradigmatic cases of acts of humans, things that happen to you, that you become aware of the intention to move your right hand or your left hand. That you become aware of the intention or become aware of the urge to move your arm. None of them are describing what would be a paradigmatic case of human action. They're just simply giving really, really nice imaging or EEG evidence about what's going on in your brain antecedent to something happening to you in conscious experience. Okay? That's not to be said that they couldn't do neurological studies on human action. But the problem is, is they haven't actually gotten the descriptive psychology correct. The concepts they're employing of a human action are actually describing an act of a human, something that happens to them, and then they've operationalized that and assumed that they've had a very robust finding about voluntary human intentions. Okay. What about ways in which empirical psychology can bring things to our attention for descriptive psychology and perhaps even change and challenge features of descriptive psychology? Here I think the range of studies on classical conditioning and operant conditioning, all sorts of subtle primings and ways in which um, we have different kinds of cognitive and social biases that are really probably going to escape most of our really deep introspective phenomenology. I think those are really, really helpful for moral psychology, the ways in which we have culpability, the way we're influenced by various in, um, economic factors and marketing factors. So integrating those into a moral psychology are really, really helpful and really, really illuminating. So Thomas Aquinas has this distinction between antecedent and consequent passions. Antecedent passions are the sort of passions that just sort of arise in any sort of situation based upon sort of our per perceptual habits, our ways of engaging and interacting with the world. And he thinks that antecedent passions are not, they're passions that happen prior to the directives or the decisions of reason. So it's the way in which, you know, companies like to pump nice sweet smells of biscuits, you know, or things of this sort when you're stepping into a restaurant or a coffee shop or into a mall. And they immediately sort of draw upon you the sort of drive or the emotion or, or the passion to seek these sort of things. There's not a rational evaluation process that's gone on. You sort of automatically do that. Well, for Thomas, that's an antecedent passion. And the virtuous person always acts from consequent passions, passions that have been elicited or have been <coughs> judged by reason or practical reason to follow. So. What's important for moral psychology is to become really, really clear of these subtle, subtle ways in which we're perceptually influenced by the world and don't actually maybe factor those into our practical reasoning. And the ways in which we can actually you know, sort of train ourselves to become aware of them and perceive them otherwise. So to sort of engage with the world and not be taken by some of these once we become aware of our perceptual and social and emotional biases. So I think those are two pretty clear ways in which empirical psychology offers a lot to descriptive psychology and can inform it and amplify it. Okay, and the time that I've left, which is not much, I will briefly go into some features from metaphysical psychology. So here's where we start entering into ontological explanations of empirical and descriptive psychology. Here we've kind of also been holding at bay a number of uh, epistemological and philosophy of language issues. Um, we also need to deal with Thomas's hylomorphic personalism and come down on some of these natural kind questions and questions about the reality of operations, powers, and the nature of human persons and how we carve them up. And here I think we can finally start to talk about form and matter and consciousness and the neurophysiological substrate. So I'm going to skip what I was going to say about um, some philosophy of language stuff, which is taken from Peter Hacker, and I will skip to the last little stage and say something about this. So one thing that's important about this whole paradigm is that we don't jump straight into mental causation of mind and body. There's a sort of, a, a sort of dictum we might follow that's phenomenology before metaphysics or something along the lines of you need to have a clear descriptive psychology of a toothache before you start dealing with the ontology of mental causation. And Thomas here follows Aristotle 
and provides us a helpful knowledge that I think is the way to sort of move forward and think through this about how mind and body, soul and body, how consciousness and our nervous system are conceptually related and metaphysically related. So Thomas follows Aristotle's analogy that just as the power of vision is the form of the eye, so the soul is the substantial form of the organic body. And the way then I think that Thomas would want us to think through this, the soul is an animating, formal, organizing, actualizing principle, and the body is the material potentiality that's organized and ordered. So what we would have here is the soul is the actualizing, organizing, substantial form of the organic body. By analogy, our cognitive powers and cognitive psychological powers, these are grounded in our hylomorphic nature, and they're actualizing and organizing forms of biological organs. Okay? But especially the complex structures of the central and peripheral nervous system. And finally, the cognitive and cognitive operations, or second actualities, these are the actualizing and organizing forms of the various neuronal, glial, and synaptic processes and events that go on in the brain. So there's a form-matter sort of unity here. A temptation is to sort of sneak in a sort of dualism still nonetheless and think of the act of seeing or an act of um, understanding or say a will act or an emotion. To think of that as a sort of one operation, the psychological operation, the sort of conscious operation. And then, then at another level, there's the sort of bodily operation. And the, the two, that's how their form matter related to each other. But it's really, really important to see that the operation of consciously seeing, that is the thing that's hylomorphically composed, that has form and matter. And it's going to involve this sort of organizational structure of the operation and of the power being a form matter component together. And we're not separating off the consciousness as one sort of operation and then the neurophysiological operations going on various kinds of neuromodulation, things that are going on synaptically, things that are going on within the neuron itself, those are part of the very act of seeing itself. You knock out some of those components, say something in B1, and you get blind sight. You knock out something in B5, and you no longer can have motion perception or visual motion awareness. You knock out something in the hippocampus or something in the medial temporal lobe, you're going to start developing various forms of amnesia. These aren't distinct operations independently from an act of memory and act of seeing. These are actually material constituents within the very form matter unity. So it's really important to avoid the sort of temptation or slide into dualism where you might think of the matter as one kind of operation and the form as another kind of operation. The unity here of the two constituting each other is really critical for getting the hylomorphism correct. There's a lot of work to be done on this, and that's very much a sketch, and you have to finesse this a lot. One final point that I think needs to be made about the metaphysics is to avoid the temptation, materially speaking, towards localization. So Thomas would have thought of the brain as pretty much divided into three large areas based on Avicenna and Galen's and others, sort of an ana uh, anatomical physiology. Today, there's still a temptation to, to identify psychological capacities and localize them. Localizing memory in the medial temporal lobe, especially the hippocampus. Localizing vision, say maybe in the lateral geniculate nucleus, or maybe in the visual cortex in the occipital lobe. I mean, these cortex, they're even named after these sort of cognitive capacities, which can kind of set the whole literature off in the wrong direction. But there's a sort of growing interest today in sort of anti-modular views. There was a modular view in psychology in the 80s, especially thanks to Jerry Fodor, and neuroscientists sort of felt compelled as if they, their way of doing things in brain science was dictated by psychology. So there was a long time of sort of having a modular view of neuroscience, a modular view of the brain based upon the modularity of psychology. But now there's a recent sort of anti-modular movement of thinking of the brain either more distributed and sort of parallel processing going on in very, very different areas of the brain. So not looking for language processing in some traditional area, maybe in the um, parietal lobe, but actually finding language processing is going all over in the brain in various different locations. Another sort of recent um, hypothesis that's getting interesting is called the massive uh, redeployment hypothesis or neural reuse, where certain areas of the brain are utilized for multiple things, but they have a sort of limited range of different things or processes that they can be functionally integrated with. So I think that one should be wary about taking our psychological activities and immediately trying to locate them in some sort of neurological structure, to be sort of slow and patient and allow, well, for one thing, the neuroscience to figure things out before we sort of presumptively say that they've kind of come to a final conclusion, but also to think that the material organization of these things might be 
you know, highly distributed or also involve lots of massive redeployment and not try to center or localize one power in one part of the brain and another power in another, then it might be a very complex sort of organizing or ordering sort of structure. Okay? But that will sort of conclude. So what I tried to provide is a sort of heuristic, a way of asking questions about Thomas's philosophical anthropology. These three stages of descriptive psychology, empirical psychology, and then metaphysical psychology are meant to be cumulative and recursive. You keep coming back at them, and you come at them at different stages, and you work your way through them. But part of the thing is, is that it's going to be a massive collaborative project. No one individual person could do all of this. And I'm not inviting philosophers to do empirical science. I'm sort of suggesting that there should be a collaborative work and process going on here. Philosophers wanting to be more interested in the empirical work that's going on in psychology, but also psychologists wanting to get conceptually clear, or neuroscientists wanting to be conceptually clear about what they're doing, developing just as rigorous conceptual self-reflective techniques as they are developing really rigorous experimental techniques. And then finally, that you shouldn't be jumping into the metaphysics and the mind-body problem until you've at least developed some appreciation for what it would be like to walk through the sort of patient process of a really robust analysis of vision or audition, and then a really rich, or at least introductory, of familiarity with recent empirical work on audition and vision, before then getting into deep questions about sensory illusions and sort of coming down on very you know, dogmatic claims about the metaphysics of vision, the realism and anti-realism sort of debates, but this sort of slow, patient walk through phenomenology and linguistic analysis, empirical studies, and then getting to the metaphysics. So, finally, we know a lot before we start. There's not any sort of pure phenomenology. But we need to sort of regiment and clarify and elucidate where we're at and how we're going to coordinate our efforts to answer these questions. And what I think Thomas's heuristic provides us with is ordering principles for what we already know and how we might reevaluate it. And finally, it sets up and orders future questions of inquiry. And so one remains a sort of human being asking oneself, what is it to be human? What am I? And I think these are you know, good questions for us to proceed on, especially since you're going to be thinking about humans with this seminar for the rest of the term. Thank you for your attention. Thank you.